Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to our final day of Court 2022. Yes, this is the last day for the Conference on Religious Trauma. It's been such an incredible experience, uh, and today is also going to be just chock full of great content for you. Uh, I'd like to remind you how grateful I am to be joining you from the unceded territory of the Sea Elk people in what is now known as the Okanagan Valley in British Columbia, Canada. And you can learn more about traditional lands by visiting native-land.ca. And just a quick note about safety at court. The Conference on Religious Trauma is committed to safer spaces online. This means that racism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, or harassment of any kind, including religious proselytizing, will not be tolerated either in sessions or in the chat. If at any time you feel that you are being harassed or you'd like to pass on some comments regarding safer spaces at court, please send us a private message or email me directly at janice.selby at gmail.com. I want to again thank our sponsors for this year's event, <clears throat> Recovering from Religion, Religion and Remission, author Aaron Donnelly, and clinical psychologist Dr. Coco Owen. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. This morning we will be uh, starting off with a discussion uh, about the church and cultural genocide with some Indigenous perspectives. And I'm very grateful and honored to have a personal friend of mine, Reg Oltus Phillips, who is an elder of the Stolo Nation in British Columbia, uh, who's going to open us up with a song this morning. Hi, Reg, welcome. Good morning. Well, I thank you for the introduction and um, as is mentioned, I am old twos and uh, I come from the Stolo Nation. Uh, the Stolo Nation runs from Hope to, to Vancouver in Musqueam there. We are the river people and we're connected very strongly by the river, the Harrison River and the Fraser River. And of course, all of the, the mountains of the territory uh, are Mother the Earth. And it stretches far beyond <clears throat> the boundaries here. It goes all the way to up across Canada, that we're all connected and we're all united. And uh, the song that I, I'd i like to share is um, it's all about connection and uh, how we're connected to all life. And uh, as it was mentioned about identity and uh, our identity as an Indigenous people, and to become a proud and honored to to be that. And so I sing this song, and um, for all the ones that are involved in this uh, really important uh, gathering this weekend, and uh, so here's the song. Oh, 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 oh,
Thank you, Reg. That was just beautiful. And I noticed that you're wearing your orange shirt, and I'm wearing my orange shirt too. And we wear these uh, to remember and honor um, those who were uh, killed and missing from the Indian residential schools across Canada. And I uh, believe there were the remains of 215 uh, undiscovered uh, at the Kamloops um, residential school last summer. So thank you for, for your song and thank you for reminding us with your shirt also. I sure do appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thanks for that. <laughs> Well, I'm really pleased that uh, <clears throat> that Reg opened us up in that beautiful way. And um, we're going to, for this session, it's going to be a little bit different. So I will be interviewing uh, someone that you may already be familiar with, Dan Barker, uh, and also a friend of mine, uh, Tsun Tsun Flumga Louise Snowden, and so first I'm going to start off a little bit about Dan. Many of you know Dan as the former evangelical minister, author, and Christian songwriter who, along with his wife, Annie Laurie Gaylor, is currently co-president of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. What you may not know is that Dan is also a member of the Delaware Lenape tribe in the land now known as the United States. I was grateful when Dan offered to share his insights into how the church has contributed to the cultural genocide of Native American people. And Dan, would you please share some of your story with us? Thank you, Janice. Nice to see you again. Nice this you. is a wonderful conference that you're putting on. So my, my family, uh, my brothers and I and my children, we are all enrolled members of the Delaware tribe of American Indians. We're very proud of that. Um, my brothers and I, and even my dad and his brothers, were pretty much urban Indians. My granddad was the last generation to actually live on Indian territory, which is northern Oklahoma. And he was five years old in the year 1900 when uh, during that census year and even though his father was half Cherokee and half British where the name Barker comes from he married my great-grandmother who was full-blooded Delaware Indian in an, in an Indian ceremony so he became a full member of the tribe that's how a lot of the tribes work membership is not by blood it's it's by ancestry and by membership and he was on that tribal council. He was a distinguished member of the tribal council for our tribe in the year 1900 <clears throat> that um, had to count <clears throat> who were the tribal members, who was and who wasn't, because 
we wanted to know as well as the government wanted to know. And my granddad was five years old at that time, so his name's on the roll, on that Dawes roll. <clears throat> so ever since then, our family had been proud members of the tribe. Delaware is not the original name of the tribe. We started off on the East Coast as the Lenape Indians, Lenape tribe. And because many of the Indians at that, in that area were living along the Delaware River, the, the colonists and the U.S. government called us the Delaware Indians. Delaware is just a, like a, a European word, some barren de la war. So it's not really the name, true name of our tribe. We are the Lenape, or more properly, the Leni Lenape, which I, a lot of the tribes did the same thing. It just sort of means the people. We are the real people. <clears throat> and um, we were the tribe that supposedly sold Manhattan to the Dutch for $24, although that was spurious. There never was a, a document that proved that. Uh, the Dutch came in and built their wall, and that later became Wall Street. And then uh, the, that's a long history. We, had, we, were the, we were the first tribe to have a treaty with the colonists. You've probably heard of the walking purchase uh, where <clears throat> William Penn's nephew, Thomas Penn, needed to settle some debts in England. So voila, he produced this document that no one ever saw uh, that said that our tribe agreed to, uh, to uh, sell the land that a, that a man could walk across in a day and a half. <clears throat> um, uh, but that document doesn't exist. Thomas Penn needed to pay off some debts, so he hired two really big, strong walkers, and they ran for a day and a half, and it even encompassed tribes outside of our own tribe there in, in what is now eastern Pennsylvania. <clears throat> we were also the first tribe to have a, a written treaty with the U.S. government, and we have the distinction of being the first tribe to have a broken treaty with the U.S. government. It goes way, way back to the beginning. We had seven migrations, and we almost went extinct. We went seven migrations through Ohio, through Indiana, into Missouri for a while, then into Kansas, outside of Kansas City, until the railroad came through, and we had to move again down into northern Oklahoma, where we joined other groups like the Cherokees, who had their own southern trail of tears ending up in Oklahoma. We had a more northerly trail of tears. <clears throat> Less than a 1,000 of us. Annie, Laurie, and I are going to California later this month, and uh, we're going to travel the Pacific Coast Highway from San Francisco down to L.A. We have mixed feelings about visiting the Spanish missions there because on the one hand, they're kind of beautiful, they're kind of interesting, but on the other hand, they are a symbol of genocide. Really, the, the Spanish church and the missionaries came and pretty much wiped out be because in 1493, that was that papal bull that somehow the god of the Spanish was able to grant all the land of the Americas to the Portuguese or to the Spanish. And in that papal bull, um, the, there was a, a command that all of the indigenous people should be converted or subjugated or subdued unto the true church. So the Spanish missions are really symbols of genocide, and uh, should we visit them or not? It, I guess it depends on how much they honor the history, how much they realized. Our tribe almost went extinct after that, but uh, luckily we stayed. We have a tribal headquarters now in, um, in northern Oklahoma. My mother was not Indian. My mother was Swedish and uh, Spanish and Mexican. She had Mexican blood. So she used to call me a sweet Indian So because, uh, because of the mixture there. But um, we, um, are, are in, the, in, in Kansas, our tribe... Uh, was missionized by the Baptists and by the um, Mennonites. And during that time, when my great-grandmother was a little girl, before she, she was five years old when they went down to Oklahoma, they became Christianized. They became very Christianized and quote-unquote civilized. The government brought them all these tools and farming to teach them. So their generation was, <clears throat> you know, what you, what you might say, not, not now. We were uprooted in the many times. And then we had a whole different way of living. My great-grandfather was quite industrious. And in fact, on Indian territory, it sounds kind of like they're living like savages out in the wilderness. They, they had a two-story cabin that they built. They had a piano. They had a lawnmower. They had a, a rock fence. They had an orchard. They had a smokehouse and a slaughterhouse and an ice house. 
Uh, and when the Sooners were coming through, the poor white people were coming through northern Oklahoma at the time, they were knocking on the back door of my great-grandparents' house asking for a handout because they were, they were very successful, very well done. But in the early 1830s and 40s, uh, they were Christianized, and to this day now, if you look at the Delaware tribe of Indians, you will see not just the turkey uh, claw and the wolf print and the turtle shell. Our, our, tri our clan was the turtle clan. You won't see just those three clans. You'll also see on our tribal seal a Christian cross. There's a Christian cross on a Native American tribal seal. And what does that tell you? What does that tell you about colonization? Not only taking away the land and the culture and the history and almost the language. There, there, there's a few people who still speak the language uh, of our tribe, but the religion and the and the views. So that my great grandmother's favorite song was "Rock of Ages." They were churchgoers. They were very Christianized, and so I inherited all of that. And that to me seems like um, uh, a tragedy. That seems like. Sure, we can allow Christians to have their faith, but why, why does it have to be imposed forcibly upon groups of people? Yeah. So, um, yeah. so basically, that's my story, uh, and we can t uh, I can answer some more questions later if you like. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really uh, interesting. You just gave me a, an education right there. Thank you. Um, and so I also want to uh, introduce, as I said, my um, dear friend, Sinsunflunga, Louise, um snowden uh also uh in uh stolo nation territory with uh, her husband old to stretch phillips um louise i will ask you to unmute yourself and then if you would tell us a little bit uh, about your background sure Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, honored and grateful to be here today. Um, didn't grow up in my culture, um, but I've been studying it since I was about 30 years old, and I'm 62 now. Um, today I have a little bit of a cold, so I might have a cough once in a while, so <laughs> forgive me. Um, yeah, so... My, I got my uh, First Nations name, um, I think about 10 years ago, and I was very honored to be able to, to get a name. Uh, my name is Zun Zun Slumga, and it means strong medicinal plant woman. And I've sort of grown into my name a little bit because uh, I do study some plants and use them for medicines. So um, I'm very honored to, to be able to do that. And um, I'm from the Weewakum Territory in Campbell River. And uh, like Dan, I uh, grew up in the urban setting. I did not grow up on my reservation. I come from a family of, uh, there was eight of us in a two-bedroom cabin that we we grew up in, and uh, it was not a good life, I have to say that. Um, my mom was uh, a residential, she was full, we would come, and um, Indigenous. Uh, her Both her parents were Indigenous, and her father was uh, a chief, and her mom was a princess, and... Um, they spoke uh, fluent, um, Lipola language. Uh, when my mom was six years old, um, the missionaries came over. We called them, I guess they called them Indian agents. Uh, they came to confiscate the children. And uh, my mom and her brother Raymond uh, were confiscated from um, their territory in Campbell River and uh, taken over to, all the way to Chilliwack to the residential school called Kokolitsa. And um, she uh, reported that she stayed there from age six to around 17 uh, years old. And um, she 
was never allowed to see her brother. Her brother was separate from her in the residential school. Um, she suffered from severe abandonment and um, felt very uh, strange to her family, even when she came back to her village um, many years later. Um, she didn't know who her family was. Like, she just, they were all, her Her mom and her um, sisters were talking Ligula, and she didn't know how to speak it anymore. And she thought they were talking about her, and um, she felt very um, like an outcast. And Raymond, her brother, never really went back to the to visit his family often, but he stayed and lived in Vancouver and, um, you know, periodically came for a visit. But um, the family was very broken and uh, she did um, end up being Christianized. And uh, our family was, because um, she married uh, my father, who was European, he's uh, from England, the Isle of Man, and um, she met my dad in Vancouver. Uh, a lot of the Kokolitsa children were just given a bus ticket to, to the city. Um, and so she ended up in Vancouver working on the fields. She met my father, who um, at the time was living on the streets. Uh, he was a war veteran, and um, he... Um, he wasn't in a good place. He drank a lot, and my mom drank a lot, and they got together, and uh, they had us children, and uh, as a result, uh, we grew up in uh, quite a bit of violence, um, family violence, um, a lot of abuse. There was physical, sexual, emotional, mental abuse in our family, and um, yeah, so... That's a little bit about uh, my history, um, um, the culture that I, I've been taught mostly is uh, the Stolo Nation culture, which is where we live now. Um, our family is from the Potlatch family on the island, and um, I know very little about my culture. Uh, I know very little about my language. Um, and, uh, I'm grateful to my husband because his family is so strong in the culture and been able to really adopt a lot of the teachings from here. And, uh, like my mom, I, when I went back, uh, even though I was raised in Camel River, uh, I moved away and then I came back again and I also felt estranged. So I believe that all of those effects from residential school is really passed down from generation to generation. Even though I didn't go to the school, I felt a lot of uh, the effects of the residential school in my life. And as a result, I've passed it on as well to my children. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me, Janice. Thanks, uh, Louise. Your story is so uh, powerful. It's sad and it's powerful, and um, I feel like it echoes a lot of other stories of First Nations and Indigenous families across Canada. Uh, so many of our uh, attendees are joining us from the United States and even some from Europe and other parts of the world. Um, and the residential school system in Canada was set up and run largely by the Catholic Church and the government uh, participated in it and the stated uh, the stated mission of the residential schools essentially was to kill the Indian in the child and this is where the cultural genocide comes in um, I get emotional on the topic because my sister came to live with us through something called the 60s scoop in Canada and so she was taken from her reserve and forced to live with strangers she didn't know us but she came to live with us because the government was removing 
indigenous children and placing them in uh, white evangelical restaurants. So this is why I wanted to have this session this morning because it needs to be an ongoing talk about the damage that has been perpetrated against indigenous peoples by the church in particular. So I had some questions for Louise and Dan, and also I see some of you are submitting questions, so I'll try to get to those too. Oh, so again, thank you so much, Louise and Dan and Rich, for participating today. Um, I wonder, uh, do you see division in Indigenous communities regarding whether members should still be practicing Catholicism? Like, are there some folks who feel like they want nothing to do with it and, and, and other folks who still feel very attached to the Catholicism that was pretty much forced on them, forced on their, uh, their ancestors in the residential schooling? Um, is that an issue uh, in in your nations that you know of? You should go first, Louise. <laughs> um, Reg and I talked about that uh, last night, and um, uh, we do. There is a church uh, just up the road on the Stahelis Reserve, and um, um, his family, Reg's family, is quite. Um, connected into that church. I believe it's a Catholic church, and um, I, I don't know how all the people feel about the church, but what I do, wit what I have witnessed is um, those specific um, pastor and his wife have more adopted the First Nations culture and traditions into their, into the church, and have really honored um, the people of Stahelis. And so, when I when I've witnessed that, and even having drumming and singing in the church, and um, you know having uh, different native symbols in the church. Um, I'm, I was really impressed to see that. I, I'm imagining, you know, that is a very rare <laughs> thing to happen in, in a church. And for me, I haven't been back to church for many, many years. Um, but I have gone to a christening in that church for uh, part of Reg's family because uh, his sister gets all of the grandkids and the, his, their kids uh, christened still so um, I don't I haven't witnessed any of the division or hard feelings um, on this territory anyways but I do know when I was younger and I went to church because I was sort of searching for some of my identity because I didn't know what my identity was um, one of the things I noticed when I went to church when I was younger with my children is that um, there wasn't any, I didn't see any Aboriginal people. And I was like, where is all of our people? Like, I just, it was odd. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing to do with Indigenous or culture or traditions or anything. Mm. So, that Thank you. A little bit about what I know. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Dan, I wonder if you have uh, any thoughts on that um, division in uh, Indigenous communities regarding whether members should still be practicing Catholicism or Christianity. Well, in, if you by community you mean the largest possible community, uh, I, do, I do know other Indigenous people and tribal members who are not Christian, Protestant, or Catholic. Uh, in fact, there's a Facebook page that some of us have started called Indigenous Freethinkers. Mm. My, my brother and the, the well-known Indigenous composer, Brent Michael Davids, who um, he's internationally famous for his orchestrations and his choral work. Uh, in fact, he was just down here. We had dinner a couple of days ago. Um, 
last last Thursday, and um, and some others um, who are basically, you know, um, insisting that none of the tribes would have like an official religion. And and the tribes didn't agree with each other about religion. They're sort of a general, the spirit of the earth and that. But it isn't like all indigenous groups in North America all had the kind of same idea. And their and their religious views changed anyway over time. So it wasn't like there's just this one stereotypical way of being Indian. <clears throat> so there are some non-believing Native Americans. Uh, and some of us are trying to get together. I don't know to do what, but just to get together. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Um, you asked about Catholicism, and in, in the United States, of course, it's mainly the, the West and the Southwest where the Spaniards were, where Catholicism was, was a big deal. In my tradition, it was Protestant because our, we came from, you know, the, the Dutch and English side of the continent moved over and then were Christianized by Baptists and that. So my, my family history is basically a Protestant history. And if there is any division, it would be a division be between those who are Christians and those who may not want to be, because even my grandmother thought to be a Delaware Indian was to, was to be a Christian. That was, that was just her thought, you know. So I don't think I can really comment too much about any other divisions. among. I mean, the tribes all had divisions, which is healthy. The tribes all, you know, don't, don't have to agree. In fact, I just read... Uh, uh, David Graeber's book and David Wengrow's book, The Dawn of Everything, where they point out that many tribal groups or regional tribal areas or regional peoples would go to great lengths to make sure that they were culturally different from the neighboring group. They didn't want to be the same. They wanted to be, we want to make sure that we are we and you are you. So, uh, and that was, that could be healthy. That could also be a source of conflict. So, interesting. Um, so I don't know too. I don't know if I can say much more about whether okay. there are groups within. Like, okay. Well, here's uh, the uh, kind of that question turned on its on its head. Uh, is there resistance by members of the Christian Indigenous community towards members returning to traditional practices? And Louise, I think you you spoke with me a little bit about this last night regarding uh, a family member who didn't didn't seem comfortable at all with traditional practices. Yeah. Yes. Um, so. My sister, um, my oldest sister, um, got into uh, Jehovah Witnessing at a young age, mm -hmm. and um, I never really understood kind of why until, you know, recently now that I'm older and I um, understand things a little better, but, uh, you know, I, I know that you know, she was very vulnerable, right? And all of us, you know, going through the abuse that we had to endure and uh, all the intergenerational abuse that's passed down really makes us a lot, very vulnerable. And, you know, looking for identity, looking for some roots, looking for some love, looking for some caring. I can see now, you know, why she was drawn into that. And, but what happened with us um, was, you know, the, I, I wasn't going to sort of buy into it, even though when I was younger, I would, she would get me to do Bible study with her. Um, on my sort of break at school, I'd go to her house and she'd, you know, feed me every day for lunch and we'd do Bible study and at that time, you know, it was fine with me. I just wanted to kind of please her. But um, as I got older, I I started to sort of grow a backbone, and she wanted me to hear her um, her talk she was going to give at the hall um, when I came over for a visit. And um, I said, no, I'd rather not listen to it. Um, and I didn't say it rudely or meanly. I just said, no, I don't. I don't want to. And she told me to get out of her house. And um, I was very shocked. <laughs> and I was like, wow, <laughs> like, this is a sister I grew up with. She was almost like my mother when I was growing up because 
my mom had so many children, so the oldest be kind of became the mother as well. And so she was like my mom. And, uh, yeah, I just think back to that and think, like, she kicked me out of her house because I wouldn't listen to her talk. And uh, it was very uh, traumatizing for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I felt that very deeply in my soul. And uh, you and I, I just, just sorry, please go on. I, I we've repaired our relationship today, and we're we're on talking terms, and we visit all the time now, and. She doesn't try to push her religion on me anymore. Um, well, that's a bit dicey. She, <laughs> I think she still does, but um, I just don't react as strongly as I, I guess I did. And uh, yeah, so the religion is very um, such where, you know, she won't come to any ceremonies, anything to do with culture. Mm. You know, she won't, uh, if there's a burning or uh, a ceremony in a longhouse or anything like that or a, a cultural funeral service, she will kind of leave. She'll just, you know, she'll stay for a little bit of it, the, the part that's, you know, okay with her. And then as soon as we start to drum or sing or light the fire for the burning, um, she's out the door. You know, and she, I think she believes that um, it's kind of praying. If we pray to spirit or the spirits, um, that we're kind of um, inviting the dark energies or almost like evil. I think, uh, I, I do think that's what she she believes. So so she she feels fine to try and push her religious beliefs on you but she is not open to traditional um practices of of her own people and your people that's that's interesting it seems sad and uh i'm really sorry that you went through that uh that breach in your relationship and kudos to you for being willing to participate in repairing that breach so you can maintain an important relationship i know it wasn't easy um thanks for sharing that dan yeah. i i wondered if you uh had any any thoughts on resistance by uh members of the christian indigenous community towards members um returning to traditional practices i don't know if you know anything about that oh you're on mute Thanks. Uh, um, well, in our family, it was sort of uh, a blend of both. Uh, the problem wouldn't be um, embracing the ancient traditions. The problem would be if you were rejecting Christianity. So I know we went to some powwows with my grandparents, and I, I, and I watched them dance the dances, and and uh, and we we were little little boys, and so we did the dances too. That we thought was fun. We liked the drumming, um, but um, but I knew my grandparents were devout Christian churchgoers, so in their mind there was no conflict. It'd be kind of like you are a member of religion, but you also have a certain music you like or or movies you like. You know what I mean? They they were not in in conflict with each other. <clears throat> Although I think Louise is right. Um, and this goes way back to the 15th century when the papal bull said not only do these natives have to be converted, they are basically heathens, they are pagans. And a lot of native cultures today are thinking, well, why should our views be heathen and pagan when these, you know, Roman Middle Eastern views that were imported over, they are not heathen and pagan? <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> my grandma was, I mean, she prayed, she gave money to Billy Graham's association, and yet she was really happy in, in, in my granddad. I still have some of the beadwork my granddad did. I think I have some of it here. Um, and he would even hum some of the old ancient, you know, prayers, I guess, spirit prayer. I didn't know what he was saying. And so, no, I didn't see that as a conflict. The only conflict would arise if um, 
you know, it, like, like what happened with me when I told my family that I now am an atheist and now I don't believe in Christianity, that was a shock to them. They wanted me back in the faith. Uh, so um, I think that's where it would arise, at least in my family. I, I wonder, um, do you see a link uh, between the behavior of present-day Christian missionaries and the way the dominant culture behaved during initial uh, initial colonization, or do you see a link between present-day missionaries uh, and still the ongoing um, desire to colonize or threat to colonize? Yeah, well, there's this condescension that happens. I remember I was a missionary to Mexico, and we American Protestants <laughs> thought we were bringing this good news down to those poor, dark, lost people. I later had to go back to Mexico and apologize. Like, <laughs> like we were we were treating them like they were somehow other or or less than the real truth. And so all all missionary efforts, going back to the Crusades and even earlier, all missionary efforts have this sort of dynamic of better and less and so the native cultures in the uh, north america and and uh, south america too that happened with the incas when pizarro went down to um to what we now call peru and they stole and they looted and they raped and they you know uh, and but they had to convert them to the true faith there's this idea that the you know in, in these terms the, the white europeans were the real people and, and everybody else was you know darker skinned or whatever we're not as not as uh, valuable as human beings so whenever you talk about missionizing i think you're going to introduce that same dynamic right L louise a question has come in for you and so i'd like to address it to you what are things you wished mental health uh slash medical professionals knew about your culture and experiences when supporting you Um, that's a really good question, um, because I have experienced a lot of um, racism in the medical field, um, um, feeling not understood, feeling like I can't have my voice, um, you know, at times not even looked at in the eyes, just... Uh, here's the prescription, you know, go away. <laughs> but, um, you know, for the medical profession to be able to have that insight um, and knowledge of some of, um, well, especially um, what happened to us, like the intergenerational trauma, that affects us all and also you know how that trauma leads us to many different uh, avenues of coping so that can be addiction most of my family ended up um, being addicts and a lot of them ended up in the medical like in emergency seeking help and um you know over and over again like a repeated revolving door and um when i would take um them there myself because i was kind of like the i don't know i the leader or the stronger person in the family um to advocate um and i would take them to the emergency so i would watch how they would treat my relatives that were drunk or drinking and you know and it was almost like they didn't know what to say like because there was like so much like devastation and powerlessness and um sometimes they wouldn't even like you know check their vitals like you know i would have to say you know like he's experiencing all these symptoms and you know, I'm not going to just take him away because he's drunk. Because something else could happen to him. You know, so I was there to advocate at times for um, some of my family members to get the help that they needed. And, um, you know, 
being a, a counselor by trade right now, uh, one of the things I had to do is take a Indigenous cultural training course myself and anybody that works for First Nations Health Authority, which is the authority in across Canada, I believe, um, they they get everyone, every one of their provi service providers that are in the mental health field to take an Indigenous cultural training. And I, I think that's what I would recommend to all the medical professionals as well. Because uh, understanding uh, our health, like um, when we have trauma, we don't deal with our trauma, it goes into our body. So for me, I've suffered uh, with most of my family, including myself, suffer from obesity, you know, and so that coping mechanism of wanting to overeat, and then we have members of my family that suffer with anorexia or bulimia, so wanting to deprive themselves of food, you know, and there's family members that are cutting um, you know, the suicide rate uh, is very high, uh, mostly for the first generation and the second generation survivors of residential school. That suicide rate is really high and it, you know, it's that stuff that we stored, right? Like that, some of it's not even ours, right? And I've learned myself to sort of um, go to the forest and you know, offer part of what I'm carrying to Mother Earth, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, my 50% of what I'm carrying is mine and the other one is my ancestors, right? Mm -hmm. So I've learned to sort of take that to the water, take that to the trees and mm -hmm. say, you know, and pray, ask my ancestors, you know, take some of this weight off of me, right? Yeah, so the traditional t traditional methods for you uh, have been somewhat healing or continue to uh, to heal, help you heal. Uh, and it sounds like uh, your your answer to the question is largely that um, medical professionals and mental health professionals really need to educate themselves uh, about intergenerational trauma, particularly related in Canada to residential um, schooling, uh, and also to, to become aware of their own uh, innate racism. And be, just, uh, because I've, I've never lived as, a, an, as an Indigenous person. I don't know what it's like to live and walk the earth as an Indigenous person. I only know what it's like to do so as a, a white female. Um, so it's really important for us to recognize our own bias. Uh, and so then we can be aware when it starts to surface for us. We really need to be learning that empathy piece and educating uh, ourselves. That was such a great answer. Thank you very much for that. Um, Dan, a question came through <laughs> for you. You'll have to put your uh, pastor hat back on, I think, for this one. Um, which Bible verses do you think are most responsible for the attitude of dehumanization and entitlement exhibited by Christian colonialists throughout history? Or if you can't remember specific verses, what what is there? Do you think there's anything specific to Christianity uh, that makes people dehumanize others and feel entitled? Well, since you asked, I have a whole book here. <laughs> A book that I wrote, um, and there's a couple of chapters, God the Most Unpleasant Character in All Fiction. <laughs> okay. And one chapter is called Ethnic Cleansing, and the other chapter is called Genocidal. There's, there's like 29 chapters. But under Ethnic Cleansing, the epigraph verse says this, God says to the people, You shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, for I have given you the land to possess. This attitude that the Israelites had and then the Christians had, and in the book I go through dozens of other verses pretty much like that, showing ethnic cleansing. You shall blot out their name, you shall uh, drive them out from the promised land, uh, drive and break down their altars and their worship. So this is right out of the same Bible that 
you know, to their credit, uh, the slaves in the American South and, and many Native Americans were quoting Moses saying, let my people go. We want freedom, right? They were using the Bible, uh, the parts of the Bible that talk about freedom, although, of course, the Israelites were most likely not enslaved in Egypt. But when you think about it, when Moses was asking Pharaoh to let my people go, what were they going to? They were going to invade another nation. Those Israelites were going to conquer and take over the so-called Holy Land that their God had given them. And so they murdered the Canaanites and they, they destroyed Jericho. They went in and destroyed per perfectly peaceful people. So I understand that modern Jews and, and others who invoke those scriptures are, are invoking them for a good reason, right? But the, the Bible is filled with example after example of dehumanizing other people who are not within. You should, they, you know, even if you have your, your own child who doesn't worship the same God, you must stone that child to death. So um, if you want, you can find the, the book's out of print, but it's going to be in print again this fall, um, where... In fact, I just read a, a great book about um, um, Charleston. There was a slave revolt, an attempted slave revolt in Charleston. Um, his name was Denmark Vesey. And when they went to trial, both sides used the Bible. The slaves were using the Bible to say, look, we are, the God gives us freedom. And they quoted verses, and they knew the verses. But the slave owners, the plantation owners, were quoting the Bible. No, but the Bible says, no, you shall be submitted. You shall, you shall subject. Slavery is ordained of God. So the Bible, you can use it either way. And even Abraham Lincoln, if you look at the Lincoln Memorial, there's up on the wall there. He says, both sides in the Civil War were quoting from the same Bible to justify their position. So there is a lot of religious teaching and biblical verses to support subjugating indigenous people. Right. And I wonder if uh, it's directly from that that the Catholic Church uh, came up with their doctrine of discovery, which really uh, empowered um, Columbus and other uh, people to go around and try and plant their flag um, in whatever uh, indigenous in places that were inhabited by indigenous people and instead claim it for the church uh, and really then uh, dehumanize the people who were already living there in their well-established societies and um, civilizations that were there uh, and they got to go in the name of God and the church um, and declare those people less than uh, because they weren't living in the same the same manner. It's I think the church was secondary. Uh, I mean, it was important, but the church was a justification. They were really claiming it for the loot. Yeah, they weren't just planting their flag. Uh, Columbus bragged about uh, the very willing thirteen-year-old girls he found all over those islands. You know, I mean, they they were raping, they were pillaging, they were stealing. They, and Spain wanted the money. Spain mm -hmm. got twenty percent of Pizarro's takings, whatever they got. And so they didn't care. They, they, they melted down these beautiful artifacts for the gold and they turned them into these bullion bars so they could go back to Spain and become wealthy noblemen. Yeah. So the, the, the church gave them the moral justification, but really it was greed. It was yes. just greed and conquest was basically what most of that was about. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's, uh, that's right. There's a question that both of you can uh, speak to if you'd like. Someone says, thank you both for being here. I wonder how you personally feel when witnessing excessive showing of patriotism uh, in the U.S. and also uh, for Louise in Canada, when you see uh, excessive showings of patriotism uh, within conservative um, culture. Like it does tend to be the very Christian groups that are really rah, rah, rah for uh, the USA. Um, but in Canada, I mean, we do have uh, Canada Day on, on July 1st. Um, uh, Louise, I wonder if you would actually speak to this first. What are your, how do you feel with regard to uh, patriotism in Canada towards Canada? Um, well, I, I don't really agree with it now in today's age. I mean, we grew up in the school, in a non-native school, having to sing Old Canada every morning. <laughs> And, you know, our home and native land, like, come on, <laughs> you stole our home and native land. <laughs> that isn't true, right? And um, so, yeah, so that, uh, you know, when it comes to things like Canada Day or 
you know, Victoria Day or, you know, um, talking about the Queen coming to the country or the Pope coming here or anything like that. Um, you know, I don't have real, like a real good feeling about it. Like I, I don't feel like, like I don't feel like they're there to support us. I don't feel like Canada Day has ever really been there to support First Nations people. And I remember last, uh, two years ago, in fact, uh, when we were, I think maybe even three years ago, when we were allowed to gather and we had the Orange Shirt Day, instead of Canada Day being Canada Day, us, we would come people in Campbell River. I traveled over to my homeland and we brought our regalia, we brought our orange shirts and we brought our drums and we brought our cedar hats. And we all sat outside uh, beside the ocean in a big circle and uh, we celebrated in our own way. And we had uh, guest speakers and, you know, uh, we had a lot, a lot of visiting among each other. And, you know, that was our Canada Day, right? And we didn't go to like, well, maybe some of us did, but, you know, we didn't go to the normal parade that would be put on and, you know, all the normal events that go on on Canada Day, which they spend thousands of dollars on, right? Like um, thinking that that money could go to so much better use. Like there's so much homelessness yes. within our um, nations. There's so much poverty. There's so much... Uh, people that uh, live in, you know, overcrowded homes, you know, the lack of clean drinking water across Canada in different places. Like, there's so much more that that money could be used for than fireworks, <laughs> you know. Or, well, yeah. I agree 100%. And, and it sounds like the event that you uh, participated in uh, in Camel River there was um, a really powerful event. I, I hope that uh, once, uh, once we're clear of the virus and we're able to be all meeting together again, I hope that really um, takes off. I love that idea. Dan, we uh, have three minutes left. Um, do you want to give uh, some words on your thoughts of uh, excessive patriotism in the United States? <laughs> yeah, well, the problem is really when it comes to white Christian nationalism. If patriotism is equated with that, as it is with a lot of people, we saw that at the January 6th insurrection, the Christian flag and the Bibles and the crosses and all that stuff. Uh, and the question of patriotism in general, you know, I, I feel different about it because we're proud of our country, obviously, in Canada or in the United States uh, for many reasons. But I, I think patriotism should not ignore the problems, you know, like a lot of laws are trying to be passed now to ignore what they call critical race theory and try to make um, white Americans feel bad about themselves. So, um, most of the tribes, I can't speak for all tribes, of course, and, and that's one, one thing we need to be sensitive to is that when you find out that somebody is Native American, don't assume that they like know all things Indian, you know, I mean, most, <laughs> most of us don't. We, we have a little snippets of our, of our heritage. But uh, I think when it comes to most of the tribes, and this is just me talking, uh, most of them are more embracing, more, more global, more let's live and let live and let's not build these walls to where we're separating between us, us and them. And patriotism tends to do that. Patriotism tends to build these walls so that we are the best and everybody else is not. That, there's a real danger in that. And I think Christianity has contributed to that whole feeling, especially white Christian nationalism. Boy, well said. I'm just so grateful uh, to both of you and to Reg also um, for joining us this morning. This has been so educational um, and people may uh, still go on submitting um, questions uh, in the chat and uh, I will try and get those to you and you also will have access to those and then uh, later on after our last session today we will be having uh, a social event and of course all of our speakers are invited to that and all the attendees as well. 
And again, I'm just so grateful. Thank you very much for um, for stepping up and for educating us in this way. I hope you'll join us for the rest of the conference. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Okay. Take care, you too, and everybody else. Uh, stay with us. We'll be back in 15 minutes. You're going to hear from uh, the amazing Mandisa um, Thomas. I'm really looking forward to that. And uh, do take time to stop by the exhibit booth. Um, also, let's uh, get information up, if we can, on... Um, about dad's book dad's book and also uh, freedom from religion foundation uh, which is his organization uh, and louise if uh, you would like to give us information um to that we can post regarding your business too uh, louise do you want to actually just tell us your website right now so that people can uh, find you for your services uh, well my, my website's not quite working right now but if somebody wanted to reach me in my home office i would um, be able to be reached at sacred teachings counseling at gmail.com and i did put that on my profile if people want to have a look at that my business number is uh 250 -830 and I'm definitely open to anyone calling me or asking questions or or anything like that. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you so much. Okay, everyone, we'll see you back here in 15 minutes. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.